Okay, so hello, Peter Todd. You write a lot about Bitcoin and involved in the issues around Bitcoin. What's your technical background? So my background is as an analog electronics designer. A lot of people in the Bitcoin community have various sort of programming backgrounds, whereas my background and what I sort of do as a day job is much more related to analysis and math. Of course, it's kind of got into them what I've done in Bitcoin, which is very much analyzing the system as a whole rather than necessarily working on software development uh, directly. When you discuss Bitcoin or when you analyze Bitcoin, it's coming from an engineering standpoint. And do you think this is different from someone who comes from a, a different background, maybe a development background or a scientific one or a mathematical one? Yeah, I think that's quite accurate. And I think what's interesting about Bitcoin is how, because it's a totally new system, there is still a lot of analysis that needs to be done. And it's also analysis that is very meaningful to math and to equations and so on, is all seen you know, in logic and reason. And because it's new enough, you know, that's still all open and it needs to be done. Yeah. How would you uh, describe Bitcoin? Well, my favorite analogy for it is I like to go talk in terms of a village. So let's suppose you had a village and everyone has a notebook. And on this notebook, you record transactions. For instance, Alice might want to go paste Hey, Bob, return for some chickens. And Alice will go and tell Bob, you can note down that we'll deduct one village coin from my account and you can add one village coin to your account. And then Bob and Alice both go tell everyone else in the village that this has happened. And very quickly, they come to consensus that, yes, Alice has paid Bob. And... Of course, the system doesn't work because people are dishonest. And what Bitcoin is, is cryptography that lets the system work by making these entries honest. How it actually works under the hood? Well, that's a whole other story. But fundamentally, it's really very simple. It's just an accounting ledger. And how about how it works under the hood? Like how would you describe it as an engineer? I would actually describe it as a political scientist, which is to go say that it's democratic. And people hate me using this term who are heavily involved in the development right. because democratic carries a lot of baggage. It makes people think you can go vote for changes to Bitcoin fundamentally, which it's sort of true, but it sort of isn't. But what's really important, though, is that going back to our village example, the way Bitcoin comes to consensus to figure out who really made what transaction is by having nodes who do something special called mining go show that they agree that a transaction's happened with a vote. And it's a very strange sort of vote because it's uh, what's called a random ballot. So approximately once every 10 minutes, a miner, completely at random, is picked, and then they get to decide what the next block of transactions will be. And over time, this is approximately like everyone voting in proportion to the hashing power they represent. And then hashing power is a special thing where, because there's no known way to vote over the internet, without involving some central authority to, you know, determine who is a human, who is someone's alias. Instead, we completely sidestep that problem by having voting involve solving this useless math problem called the proof-of-work problem. And, you know, that's a technical thing, but long story short is you do some useless work and you get a certain amount of voting power, so to speak, which gets referred to as hashing power, and then that's how you decide where the Bitcoin blockchain goes. Some developers don't my using the term voting, I mean, maybe there's also some feeling that it's like people aren't participating in the changes. I think Bitcoin. what it really comes down to is an analogy would be Bitcoin is a system with an incredibly strong and restrictive constitution. The voting in the system can do nothing more than decide what transactions are accepted and what ones aren't. It cannot make a transaction that is invalid because it doesn't follow the rules of Bitcoin get accepted into the chain. It cannot make the rules of Bitcoin change. All it can do is decide that the transaction may or may not be included in the blockchain at a particular time. That's it. So it's, you really can't do much with that kind of voting. That's nefarious, at least assuming everyone checks the rules. So Bitcoin is a consensus system. Is that awesome or not? And what's the problem? Or is there every technological kind of property has its upsides and its downsides. What are the upsides of a consensus-based system? What are the downsides? Well, certainly the upsides is that when it's working properly, it's very free from outside interference. The consensus automatically is a consensus of a majority. So anyone who participates in Bitcoin fully is part of that consensus, part of that choice. And for some outside force, such as a government or a large corporation, 
to go manipulate that consensus is only possible if they choose to participate in it. Now, of course, this does leave Bitcoin open to something called the 51% attack, where some group or person or whatever chooses to buy enough enough hashing power to outvote everyone else on Bitcoin. And because they can do that, then they control the destiny of the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, they can't go and put invalid transactions in the chain if everyone else is checking it. But what they can do is they can just stop transactions forever appearing, or they potentially rewrite history. Transactions that have been confirmed as part of Bitcoin get undone bit by bit. How will Bitcoin evolve, and what is the power that the miners have, and how will that balance of power change? Well, you know, I keep on saying that if everyone uses Bitcoin correctly, miners don't have any power. But there's a big catch with that, which is a lot of people are using Bitcoin without actually verifying Bitcoin, the history of the blockchain. And the technical term for this is called SPV nodes, which stands for Simplified Payment Verification. And an SPV node skips all this laborious checking that everyone is being honest and following the rules. Rather, it assumes that everyone is following the rules and assumes that the majority of hashing power is correct and just leaves it with that. And the problem with this then is it does create a situation where mining is voting. You know, if everyone only used SPV nodes, then a miner could very well decide that, yes, 51% of the majority now decides that Bitcoin can be inflated and we can make however many Bitcoins we deem necessary. And if they choose to do that, they can make Bitcoins out of thin air. And unless you check the history, you have no way of knowing if that has happened. Of course, in practice, someone does this and... You'll see it on the news, you'll see it, and so on and so forth. But from a software level, your software isn't checking that, and that's a real problem. And we do not yet know how the, really how the political science of decentralized cryptocurrencies actually works. You know, if miners choose as a majority to create Bitcoins out of thin air, does that mean people shun those miners? Does that mean people start writing full nodes? I don't know. I don't know that we're going to know until it happens. Yeah, the blockchain is getting bigger and bigger. So how can we own that infrastructure? Well, this is the big catch with Bitcoin. If you have a consensus system, to have consensus over the history of the blockchain, every person who has that part of that consensus must have the entire blockchain, which just doesn't scale. You know, if you have pure science terminology, if you have N people who are participating in this Bitcoin blockchain, and each of those people makes a transaction, well, then every person needs to process everyone else's transaction, n squared, it's exponential growth, or heck, I should be more mathematical, it's quadratic growth, and that just doesn't work as you get enough people. Fortunately, computers are extremely fast and efficient, and we've been able to get away with the system for a lot longer than, in some rights, we really should have. You know, in some senses, we've made this We've made this pig fly by attaching ro- rocket motors to it. But that only goes so far. And in the long run, we have to go do something about it. How that will actually take place, I don't know. What I do know is that if we don't solve this problem, and we're already seeing this, we see people run Bitcoin clients or use Bitcoin in ways that doesn't verify this history. And is therefore outsourcing your trusts to someone else to do the job for you, which sounds very much like conventional banking anyway. Yeah, you said something about good Bitcoin like a, a political science. Yeah, yes. in some way it's also about like the economics yes. of how the miners and all the different groups in Bitcoin interact, you know, the manufacturers, the developers. Yeah. What what are some of the interesting like models or concepts that you see emerging out of that that will that will happen in the future that you could that can well, give us a glimpse about how this system what, will function on a macro scale. What I want to see happen is for there to not be distinctions between all those different groups. You know, when we have these distinctions, mm-hmm. that's when Bitcoin is threatened. Because when you have those distinctions, you're putting especially with regard to mining, you're putting control into a smaller group than everyone. The ideal Bitcoin system would be everyone participates equally. Everyone does a bit of mining. Everyone does a bit of validation. Everyone is pulling their own weight. And it's very unfortunate that due to the technical issues, we're not seeing that. Instead, we're seeing people outsource all their trust to centralized services like blockchain.info, centralized dependent technologies like SPV nodes, like Android Wallet. And, you know, again, Electrum follows the same sort of problem. Whereas using Bitcoin with full nodes as... uh, 
as is done with the Bitcoin reference implementation or with Android Wallet. That's not so popular, and people are, in a sense, taking the easy way out. Now, if you go and change the way the technology works to make it easier to, for instance, verify parts of the blockchain, then everyone can go and pitch in. Everyone can be a part of this. But there has to be a will that, yes, this is important, and yes, we need to change the technology to do that. Currently, you know, we've got people who get a lot of attention and a lot of respect by some parts of the Bitcoin community who don't see these issues as important at all. You know, they just dismiss it as something that, you know, whatever, Bitcoin's working fine. Bitcoin needs to fix scalability. Let's just have a quick patch to this and go on from there. Whereas I think the more thoughtful people in the community realize that it's not so easy to fix problems in Bitcoin once you cause them because you've got this huge moving system You've got actors who may have incentives to leave the problems in place. And furthermore, you've competitors to Bitcoin, like Litecoin and other alt currencies, that may very well just take Bitcoin's place instead. What do you think are the technical problems that are driving this kind of inevitable specialization? Well, I don't think it's inevitable. If we study this issue and we think carefully about it, we can go find ways to make it not inevitable. You know, in some small ways, I've done things myself like that, like uh, I propose this technology called TXO commitments that enables nodes to not store the full history of the blockchain while still with other technologies can still verify parts of it so that as a collective, the entire history is verified. There's also things like fraud proofs, which enables nodes that once they do find the rules have not been followed to sound the alarm and tell everyone else so that they can immediately take action. There's also concepts for how to go shard the blockchain to go reduce the individual amount of the scope that any one person has to evaluate to come to consensus. And finally, on top of all that, there's sort of more immediate, more practical ways to achieve this stuff like off-chain transactions, which just takes the load off the system and buys us time. None of this stuff is all perfect, but it's important to go and research this stuff and accept that the road ahead is bumpy and we cannot allow Bitcoin's decentralization to be sacrificed. You know, we may find that by doing that, we wind up with Bitcoin that doesn't grow quite as fast as some investors would like, but that is a much better trade-off than destroying what Bitcoin offers to the world. What's the sharding? That sound, that's interesting. Well, the basic idea behind that is a recognition that you don't necessarily have to have one consensus domain. And that's kind of a very technical term that really means you don't actually have to have everyone have a complete view of the entire state of the whole system at once. If you're clever, you can restrict the view that any one person has to have. A very simple example I like to use, which isn't necessarily a great idea, but it's, you know, it's an idea that can work, is suppose you had a ring of blockchains and you made the system such that pairs of adjacent blockchains on this ring had to be verified in parallel to allow mining to progress. Because each pair is verified, you can move coins in a series of transactions around this ring from one blockchain to another. It would use a special... Yeah, yes, a special type of transaction. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which we already actually have the ability to. Right, it's, it's just, wiki, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't work as well as we might like. But if you built a system around this concept, you would make it work. And what that means is that even though any individual miner only needs to keep up with a small section of this weird ring system, you can still spend coins from anywhere. You can send them to anyone, and the whole system as a whole actually works. But, of course, there is a ton of practical issues that need to be solved and need to be studied. But, you know, if you accept that decentralization is important, you go solve these issues. You know, you go study them rather than just taking the easy way out. So the block side, the blockchain is getting bigger and, and bigger, but there's a, a limitation in the code, which is limiting the size of the blocks. Correct. And making them a scarce resource. So there are less transactions getting into a block than if this limitation didn't exist. After all, the blockchain is big. With certain technologies like TXO commitments and its close cousin UTXO commitments, you don't actually need to download the entire blockchain to get your node started. You can download a subset of that data. Or potentially with TXO commitments, no data at all. But you still have to keep up with the bandwidth of new blocks as they come in. And that's a real problem. Because if you allow the block size to grow, the size of an individual block, then at some point, it's a sufficient amount of bandwidth that not everyone can keep up. 
and especially not people on low bandwidth connections like home residential connections and especially anonymous connections. And on top of that, and something that's been found more recently is that you create very perverse incentives in that, and I'm going to get a bit technical here, the cost to include a transaction in the block is related to how fast you can tell other miners about that transaction and about that block as a whole. And if you are a miner who has a lot of money, you can invest a lot of effort into fast internet connections, your cost goes down, which means you make more money, therefore you can have more equipment, therefore you can make more money. And also, just by being bigger, you're less likely to have someone find a block at the exact same time and not be the one who found the block that wins. So that's called your orphan risk. And again, the bigger you are, the lower your orphan risk is. And it's just this set of interlocking incentives that drive centralization. With a block size limit, though, at least the incentives have a limit in that, sure, there's still an incentive to be a bigger miner than a smaller one, but the amount of incentive compared to the total incentive to mine at all is much smaller. You know, we in the theoretical community, if you will, we can go see how potentially that incentive will not cause disaster. In there. Whereas if you have no limit at all, that incentive is much, much stronger. And it's hard to imagine how mining wouldn't become very centralized in that circumstance. Yeah, so the block size limit is a really important issue for you. And uh, you're saying that the consequence, if we just got rid of it, while transaction fees might drop, might become lower, it will allow miners to form an even bigger cartel. Yes, and not so much allow, but encourage them to. Encourage them to, yes. right. But sure, surely the market will self-regulate. Like Why would it? Some people say that if a miner produces a block that's too big, then another miner will just reject it. What would you say? Right, but this is the issue. If you produce a block that's too big, the actual incentives end up being that you are in more money in many cases than the miners who didn't do this. And the reason is, if your block ends up being accepted. While other miners were not mining to extend your block rather than the block before, they were wasting their time. So that means some percentage of the time where they could have been earning money was spent wasted, whereas for you, 100% of the time wasn't wasted. So if your goal is to earn more money than other miners, which is generally what a business wants, because after all, if they're earning more money, the miners, or I should say the hashers, who are mining at that pool will go move from the smaller pool to the bigger one. So you get this ugly set of incentives. You know, it's not enough to go go make the assumption that the market will self-regulate. In this case, it doesn't. If you're going to have to increase the limit in the future? I don't know. I, just, I think in the near future, we definitely should increase it because we already know that increasing it will lead to disaster. Now, if we only increase it a little bit, maybe it won't lead to disaster. But we know at some point, if we increase it enough, it will. And because the political science of decentralized cryptocurrencies isn't well understood, we don't know what's going to happen when that limit is breached. It may be that you can't recover because there's simply too much incentives from a large part of the community to continue in a bad situation. Again, talking about pools, if a pool knows it will make less money because the limit gets reduced, they're going to push very hard to keep the situation as it is, even if it leads to a Bitcoin where effectively only you know, handful of people control it with no other way around it. How destructive the effects of increasing the block size limit, will it be observable? For instance, if I if we double the block size limit, you know, would it be 10 times less worse than if we 20 times the block size limit? Or is it something that you increase and you might not see the effects, but then you breach some limit and the system breaks down? In your model, how would increasing the block size limit well, keep in mind, we're not strictly talking about technical stuff here. Right. We're talking about social stuff. For instance, in an environment where governments do not attempt to regulate Bitcoin, you can get away with much, much bigger limits than in one that you can. And the reason is that if governments do not attempt to regulate Bitcoin, it's much more acceptable for miners to be publicly known. It's much more acceptable for them to be forced to have the type of high bandwidth internet connections that are easy to find and shut down. Whereas if government decides to start regulating Bitcoin more heavily, and remember, we're talking regulating here, I really doubt they would ever try to ban it. Rather, they would do things like say, all right, miners must only mine approved sets of addresses. Or even more likely, miners must not mine transactions related to certain blacklists. 
And that kind of regulation can creep up. And while it's happening, it's very easy for larger mining pools, which have an incentive to exist because they make more money, to then start following these regulations. So you might, for instance, find that your transactions, which were related to some nefarious deed that some government has decided needs to be stopped, you suddenly can't spend the money in your wallet without waiting maybe a couple hours till that 1% of miners who are not following those rules finally gets around to finding the block. Maybe five years down the road, you'll never be able to make a transaction. We do not quite know how this is going to play out, but we can certainly go and see that having mining power more centralized makes it much easier to control what the mining power does. Uh, do you see mine, miners as the biggest threat to Bitcoin? In some ways, yes. But not miners, mining pools. Mining pools. You know, the size of mining pools is a very, very big threat. Yeah. We've all seen the big ASICs, like the big facilities. Well, ASICs are another matter. Like, you've got to remember, there's a difference between mining pools and mining hardware. Right. Mining pools seem to be a fundamental, desirable feature because people want it to be easy to get their hashing equipment and start hashing and earning money. And it's much easier to do this by selling your hashing power to a mining pool. It's also about lowering your expectation, but also lowering your variance. Yes, lowering your variance, not not expectation. Well, you're sacrificing some expectation for that. For for that, uh, you have to find what you mean by expectation. The your average payout. If you might solo mine, you would get more. Right, right. But well, that's not necessarily true. In fact, it appears that mining at a mining pool, you do earn more money per block. Assuming modulo the mining pool's fees, the, the bigger mining pool earns more money per unit hashing power than a small solo miner. Why is that? Well, that's because they're more efficient. Oh. And they're more efficient because they find, because more of the blocks that they find are not orphaned. Ah, oh, okay. And they're also more efficient because they have one set of expenses that's amortized over all the clients, whereas you had to go pay for a full Bitcoin now. And, you know, like it or not, it's not, it's not free. You have to go pay for your time setting it up. You have to pay for your computer. And those expenses are only getting higher in the future. When you shop with Bitcoin on Gift, you can get gift cards from over 200 retailers. Think of the possibilities. Not only is your holiday shopping taken care of in a snap from your Android device or on the web, but now you have a way to purchase everyday items from stores like Target, CVS, Gap, and GameStop using your Bitcoins. That's not even the best part. When you shop with Bitcoin on Gift, you get 3% back. Ready to shop? Visit GYFT.com today.